came by today to see you Oh, I had to let you know If I knew the last time that I held you Was the last time I'd have held you And never let go Oh, it's kept me awake nights wondering I lie in the dark just asking Stand up for what you believe And follow it through When I try to make it make sense in my mind The only conclusion I come to Is a heaven Just be The Doc Smith that I knew would not have wanted a big, long, drawn-out farewell. I think he would have said, don't go on too long, Spudley. <laughs> Make it short and sweet, but respectful, and tell my family and friends to move on and to make the most of their time. Doc wouldn't want you to be sad but he would be so thankful that you good people here today meant so much to him. You will all have and hold dear many special memories of this special bloke and those memories will stay with you forever. You will always treasure Doc's lasting legacy. Nothing can now detract from all that you have shared with Doc. Nothing can now affect the great happiness 
and depth of experience that he himself knew. The past, with all its meaning, is sacred. It is also secure. And your love for Doc and his love for you, his family and friends, can never be altered by time or by circumstance. Officially, it's good afternoon to you all and, and welcome as you have gathered to pay your respect to a good man, an iconic man, a local legend. There are many ways to describe our doc. Officially, Mr Shane Robert John Smith. Not many people call him that, I don't think. But, uh, yeah, yes, he'll be so sadly missed. My name is Dudley Corbett. Yes, that's it. <laughs> I am indeed honoured to be invited by the family to conduct this celebration of Doc's life and what a life it is to be celebrated. And a little bit later on, we have some very eminent speakers to join us who will eulogise this man in a fitting matter. I can assure you that. The service will take place in its entirety here in the chapel, but I know that Many stories and laughs will be shared at various venues afterwards as you each go your own way and mingle with each other and share all these wonderful stories and memories. And there are just so many stories. Woof. The family have also asked me to thank you for this wonderful attendance here today to assure you of the great comfort it gives them to know that Doc was so loved and so respected. The service today is being live streamed and it's going as far as a field as London, I believe, and uh, goodness only knows where else on live stream, but I know that a couple of organisations in Penguin will be glued to the television set, namely the, Nep the boys and girls at the Neptune Hotel and the Sports and Services Club, and they'll be watching in and they uh, had a great affiliation with our Doc Smith. As I sat with family members the other day, I learned that Shane Robert John Smith was born on, born on the 30th of July, 1960, in Burnie, to Dawn and Bill, so well known in Penguin Town. His siblings, Cheryl and Jenny. Doc went to the Penguin State School and then on to Alveston High and uh, he was only 15 years of age when he left school there and uh, went into the butchery trade with his family. It was a family business in Penguin and uh, they had the business next door to Swanee Gornick's. <laughs> what an education that would have been. <laughs> yes, and he was there employed, gainfully employed there for over 25 years. Doc was a natural sportsman and I hope I don't pinch too much thunder from the speakers to follow but uh, whatever he took up, whatever he decided to go into, he excelled at. He was one of those fellows that had an undeniable talent for just about everything that he did. He was just a natural and uh, I can remember him plainly in the 1980 Penguin Premiership. I think a couple of us are probably getting sober almost. Doc met Lani Dixon and they were only uh, youngsters at the time and uh, they were married in 1980 and the family arrived, Kurt and Aaron, and uh, they enjoyed many happy years together. A little bit later on when that uh, liaison dissolved, he met Debbie and they married in 1995 and he adopted Emma and Adam and they looked upon him as a doting father as well. His grandchildren, Atticus and Aldous, and uh, he was known, I believe, as Poppy Doc. He had a variety of jobs after he left the butchering trade. He was a cleaner at the Penguin High School. He was barman at the Sports and Services Club. I think he was barman at the Top Pub in Penguin years ago. He used to fumigate houses well, uh, how shall I put this? It was an official thing. 
It wasn't just after a feed of onions or something like that. No, he did it. Uh, and weed spraying, he uh, went on the weed spraying business in the employ of Mr Kevin Brown. He loved to listen to the ABC radio, uh, listen to the, na the nags and the news and uh, television. He loved the ABC side of things there. He was a little bit musical and he played the banjo and the guitar and uh, he liked all general styles of music. He wasn't too one-eyed, but he did play the part of a little drummer boy in a production at the state school one day. I'd like to see a video of that. <laughs> he was a snappy dresser and those of you who knew Doc well, he always looked like he'd just come out of the dry cleaners. He, <laughs> He, he was always immaculately dressed and presented like the gentleman that he was. His interest, he, uh, he loved his fishing at Great Lake, he loved the outdoors, he loved his racing yachts on Hamilton Island. He was just so well known, everybody in Penguin at least knew who Doc Smith was and I'm sure that he knew who they were as well. But he, he left us with a wonderful reputation and uh, certainly some wonderful memories and, and an amazing legacy. There's no doubt about that. I have some uh, wonderful speakers to join in just a few moments, but I also have a couple of, couple of memories here that I would like to, to share with you. And... Uh, I'll read this one to start with. And it's headed, Doc Smith. It's a good heading. I had one year and ten days and I became Doc Smith's sister. From such an early age, Doc was able to tell stories and porky pies that would quite often land us in big trouble. It was five years before Jen arrived and the Smith family from Deviation Road was complete. Doc was always able to tell a great story, but more importantly, convinced all who listened that they believed exactly what he said. <laughs> One tale just recently he told me, he was swimming across Preservation Bay and came face to face with a shark. Now, the shark, according to Doc, was so shocked that it swam away and Doc turned around and swam back to the beach. Now, Doc, on the back of his shorts, his swimsuits, he had written, Collingwood to win the flag. And he said, no respecting, no self-respecting shark would swallow that. <laughs> Sorry, Collingwood. A man on the beach uh, saw it, he witnessed it, and when the Doc came ashore, he said, that was amazing. He said, uh, he said I, I don't believe that. So whether you believe it or not, Doc always told the truth, didn't he? Might have embellished it a little, but... Being Doc's sisters, Jen and I experienced many pranks over the years. When we were young, he constantly left us wondering how he could get away with things and we would only have to do it once and we'd get caught. We laughed and loved our way through our childhood with our cousins, family, friends, who copped the brunt of Doc's wit. Tony probably wore more than anyone else. Whether it was being chased by Doc on his bike, having sausage mince shoved in your drink, being woken up because Santa's boot was stuck in the chimney, Growing up with Doc was never dull. We spent many years fishing at the lakes and every weekend we would pack up and head away. We would always make our own fun while we were there. Doc found it easy to excel at sport. He excelled at school, never having to worry about study as that came naturally as well. He thrived having people around him, always making all who were with him feel special. He made me feel special and was always so protective. I have a beautiful sister and I had a beautiful brother. 
We loved him dearly and I will be forever grateful. Or we will be forever grateful that we were Doc Smith's sisters. Thank you, Cheryl, for that. And now I'd like to call on a man who spent a fair bit of time in the sporting area uh, with Doc, probably mainly uh, surf club and football club, and I speak of our good friend Mr Rodney Adams, and Rodney has got a story or two to tell us, no doubt. So I'll invite you to the podium, sir. And yeah. Please don't let the truth interfere with a good story when you get up here. Because not a uh, doc didn't. <laughs> it's all yours, Rodney. Um, firstly, I'd like to um, just read out from Shane Jupp, send something up from the family. When I was 10, that was grade three, a family friend gave me the opportunity to earn some pocket money cleaning up in the local butcher shop in Penguin. We've become great mates despite the age difference. And I worked alongside him until I was 17. After those years, I learned the trade of a meteorologist, but most importantly, I gained an apprenticeship in customer service from the goat. Butchers have a unique sense of humour and the way Doc applied it to his loyal followers gave me an insight into what customer satisfaction meant, how much it cost and what value it carried. Genuine thoughtfulness, rapport with a diverse clientele and generous in his teachings. That would be Doc telling everyone what to do. My time on the tools has afforded me many great opportunities and I feel that my work ethic was solidified largely during to this part of my life. Many of my one-liners were stolen from this man. He taught me a new language, most importantly, he was always pleased to see me and I him. I was, unfortunate, I was fortunate to see him recently and tell him how much I valued our time as tradesmen and apprentice. I hope my girls can have a friend like this. Thanks for everything, Doc. Let's change up. So I probably I was an equaliser. Doc could talk his shit and I'd call him out on it. So um, first of all, just acknowledge that there's some guys up in Queensland, good mates of Doc's, Daffy, Jack, Noel King, Tony Porter, Shane Revel and Rod Hodgetts are all sitting in a hotel somewhere watching this. Uh, Wayne Short, Shorty in Melbourne, he tried to get over as late as 10.30 last night and couldn't make it. So those guys are thinking of Doc as well. Oh, my memory is when we moved back to Penguin was um, being a main street kid and that's where most of us, the Coronet Street, Doc, Deviation Road and everything, we're all the main street kids, not the Mission Hill kids. And we used to all hang around the shops and down the surf club. Our first outing with Doc was with Bill, Dawn, Shirley, my, um, I think it was Jenny, Doc, myself and my brother in their car. And there was no chance of anyone getting injured because there was no room to move. <laughs> um, up there, we went our first trip away and we went up and Anyway, I hear this laughter at about five o'clock in the morning and here's Doc laughing, he buns off and I'm going, I wake up and think, what's wrong, what's happened? And apparently he woke up to my brother standing at the window of the little humpy, urinating on the window because he thought he was out the back door. The trouble was I was underneath that window. <laughs> so Doc was pretty chuffed with that and then he went, used to love going around and telling everyone that he saved my life on that trip. Now, I've had the name Bumbler since I was probably 11 years, 12 years old, and that was due to coordination issues. Found out what it was. There's something between my ears that won't equalise. So Doc said, oh, here I am on the boat, and I'm floundering around up there and learning how to trout fish. Next minute, I'm over. And he was proud of Punch to say, you go around all the friends, and I saved his life. I saved his life. I pulled him out of the water. And it'd go on, and I'd call him out. Did I really go under, Doc? Was I drowning? Well, he said, I helped you back in the boat. So that was good enough for Doc to save, save my life. In his early days, you know, we spent most of our childhood, I suppose, the surf club, and he was an athlete. He was um, always fit, and he was always had, um, skillful, very quick. He won many championships in his uh, running and also the beach flags. 
and he'd tell everyone around him what titles he won, how many times he's won, and I'd come back and say, Doc, we made you win them. And he'd say, why is that, Rod? I said, because we used to go on the beach flags and pick out the best runner, and due to my coordination issues, I'd get up and smack him down. <laughs> And being a bigger guy that I could sort of put people down and say, sorry, and you know, sorry, mate, next time, he'd win a Tasmanian title and he'd be proud as punch. Um, also, that's where we, got, we were able to have mentors. Probably not all good mentors, the older guys, who were probably five, six years older than us. They taught us how to drink, where to drink, the cheapest way to drink, uh, how to have fun with no cost, and um, that's where we learned a lot of our life skills. It was um, quite an interesting upbringing. We used to also go have parties. The only parties we were allowed to have was Bill and Dawn's house right down the back. And Bill would always buy six long necks. And there'd be 10, 12 of us in there and we'd have Elton John on, we'd be singing to that, we'd be listening to all the music. And the thing was to pass the bottle round and unfortunately, I only got one turn at going first and uh, then the rest of the boys had to sit there and look at a fair few empty long necks and uh, so I wasn't invited very often after that. <laughs> also um, we had an occasion when Doc he found out about his love of music. We were, stayed at our place down at the shop and we were sitting down listening to the radio and the Shangri-Las come on and the favourite song was Leader of the Pack. And this song was going on and we're listening to it and we had this image of Harley Davison's big bikies and everything else. And then they had the, if anyone's ever listened to it, the sound of a motorbike, it was probably 125 or a Honda Monkey 50. Bing, 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 like this. And he'd, he'd laugh, he'd think it was the funniest thing in life. And we'd always have this joke when I seen Doc, I'd always say, broom, 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 broom. <laughs> and he'd just shake his head. The other thing Doc was significant for was his Corolla, his nice red Corolla with the curtains in the back and uh, he was proud of Punch of that because he could go touring, he could go uh, overnight camping at certain places and thought this was the, the duck's nuts. He um, sort of, one other thing was we were always pleased that Doc left at year nine because it gives us the rest of us an opportunity to talk to the girls. So we're pretty, pretty thankful for that, for Bill and that, to get him out of the school. It was one of the highlights. Always like to um, create a conversation with Doc, because you know when Doc wanted to have a talk, he'd cross his leg, he'd flick his head a little bit, his mannerisms were great, you know, and he'd go, now. And he'd off, he'd go on a tangent, it'd be 15 minutes later, and you'd just say, nah, it's not on, Doc. It wouldn't happen. No, nah, it couldn't happen. And he'd get frustrated and then all of a sudden you get that stupid bloody grin and that laugh and annoy the shit out of you. And uh, so I thought oh, I'll get him back this day and I'm walking down the street and here's the big meat sign out the front. So I marched into the butcher shop and I said, Doc, there's an issue. And what's that, Bumbler? I said, you can't have foul language on that meat board out there. I said, it's, it's got old ladies walking up and down here. They don't want to see that. And Doc's going... Well, what's that? I said, you can't advertise dickhead meat on the bloody board. And he's looked and he's thinking, what? And he, so we march out there and here he is and he's looking at it and he's looking at me, looking at him. And all of a sudden it clicked with him. He's turned around and looked at it. It's diced beef, you dickhead. <laughs> march back in the shop, the old screen door. We didn't talk for a little while after that. He was a bit upset over that. Doc was also my best man in my wedding, 40 or one, two years ago, and he still had, the, still had the unit, the nice hair. He was very proud of his hair, had to be sharp, even when it was permed. And um, so, yeah, Doc, that was one of Doc's two things. I always swim across the bay every morning at 4.30 in the morning. And um, the other thing was, just got a haircut. Pretty sharp, isn't it? Um, the other, I suppose, the most... Uh, recent memories of Doc was after our school reunions. You know, that was an opportunity for all of us to get together and he loved to chat, he loved to catch up with people. He was interested in what people were, had, were doing with their lives. He'd then not uh, Facebook stalk them because Doc wouldn't do anything like that. 
and um, it just found it was in discussion. It was just one of those best things in life in our later years now that we could all just sort of catch up with our old friends and learn about them. He, um, yeah, he was going to. Or well, after that reunion, we actually went back to Daffy's unit up above Terry's place, and we're having a a mild conversation with a few drinks. Anyway, it's four o'clock in the morning. I said, walked out with the doc and he's platting his feet everywhere and he's looking up the road and I said, it looks like your swim's turned to shit, mate, because I don't reckon you could kick your legs the way you're going. I'll be up. I'll be up, he'd go. And off he went. I reckon it took him near three hours to get home. <laughs> I never saw him for a few days. So, yeah, we had, we had a good good life together. We, we, had, we were fortunate we were brought up in a good era where we had a lot of community and we had a lot of people looking out for us, a lot of people educating us and doctors fitted in and I was going to miss just that silly buddy smile and that stupid laugh he'd have and cross his legs and flick his hair and, and then talk crap. It was lovely. <laughs> miss you, mate. Uh, uh, good on you, Rodney. Yeah, sounds like you knew him as well. Just before I read the next uh, tribute I have in front of me, I have a little note here and it says, Doc was a member of our social club, always willing to help in the fight for cancer. I worked with Doc at the top pub and we had lots of laughs. He would tell me about his problems. Doc, we're going to miss you, but I'll be waiting in the chook house story there somewhere. Deepest sympathy to all the family from Rhonda, Mazza and members of the Neptune Social Club. Thank you for that. <clears throat> and now some memories of growing up with Doc shared by Adam, Emma and Deb. Doc was a man <clears throat> who gave so much to so many but expected so little in return. Doc, you came into our lives at a time when we all needed you and you made us smile again. We will always be grateful to you for the many happy memories that we have. Although you were met with a mixed reception that first time you rocked up to our house with a bunch of flowers, we are so glad that you persevered and hung around. In fact, the story of the way Emma stared you down over the dinner table became one of your favourites to share. We will miss your stories the most. <clears throat> Nobody could tell them the way that you could and this is a lasting legacy. The truth never got in the way of a good story like that epic wave you rode at Preservation Bay with a crowd cheering you on from the beach. Whew. And the time you saw the minister dancing with a stolen dog. You'll have to explain some of these things later, you people. <clears throat> Many of these stories were shared in afternoons spent with you in the butcher's shop and watching the way you chatted easily to your valued customers. Always pleased to meet you and meet to please you at Doc's Quality Meat. You were something of a fashion icon in Penguin with that immaculate silver flat top hairstyle. It was only compromised once when you insisted on dressing up as Hugh Hefner. <laughs> yeah, you'd have made a good one, Doc. For a fancy dress party and you ask Emma and Deb to dye your hair black using a dodgy packet dye. It became rather permanent and it took a long time for your hair to get back to its usual silver status. Deb elevated your dress sense to a new level and after that starring role as an extra in Mission Impossible, and he did actually appear in Mission Impossible, you were practically a celebrity around Penguin. The unofficial mayor and the street just does not feel the same without you. We loved the way you listened to ABC Radio in the Shed and your diverse tastes in music. You liked to listen to Shania Twain's Let's Go Girls 
to get in the mood for golf. You were happy in your own company, lost in your thoughts, but equally you were always available to anyone who wanted to chat. You gave advice generously and always had a story for every occasion. At times it was difficult to tell if Adam and Emma's friends had called to see them or to spend time with Doc. He loved making up epic meat packs for Ad and his mates to take on their camping trips, but he was equally at home <clears throat> offering love life, love life advice to him and to her girlfriends. <laughs> oh, the mind boggles. So <laughs> that's not here. I just put that bit. In. So many happy memories were made at Iron Cliff Road, and guests were always greeted warmly by Doc's valet parking service and he was there at the ready <clears throat> to take their keys and turn their cars around via a hundred point turn. So there was no need to reverse down that treacherous driveway. When you know what hit the fan, it was always Doc that Ad and M ran to first. He often said, <clears throat> I'll talk to you mum, knowing that he could smooth things or most things over. And as Deb will tell you, it was impossible to stay angry when Doc was involved. He could always find the funny side to every situation. Even when he came home to discover the hallway of Ironcliff Road burning after Ad had a misadventure with the wood heater. Doc knew exactly what to say and do, and he would have known what to say today as well. He blew everyone away with his heartfelt speech that he made at Emma and Lee's wedding. Everyone was in awe at the way he got up and spoke so sincerely about his luck in finding a lovely daughter, Emma. To Kurt and Aaron, thank you for sharing your dad, not only with Adam and Eva, Emma, but with everyone who loved his kind heart, his sense of fun and his gentle spirit. He was so proud of all of us. He was a great friend to Deb, to Katie, to Lee, Owen, Albie and Bob. Doc was many things to many people, but ultimately he was a friend to all. One thing we can be certain of is that the legend of Doc will live on through his stories. Though we may, may not be able to tell them as well as he could, we will remember them and remember him always, as all of us here today certainly would. Thank you for sharing those stories with us. And now I'd like to call on a man who spent a lot of time uh, with, with the doc and uh, shared a lot of stories, shared a lot of secrets and shared the well-being of the little village of Penguin and I speak of our friend Mr Terry Burton and I ask Terry to come forward now and to regale us with a story or two. It's over to you Terry. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, my name's Terry Burton and uh, I'm, a, I'm a very special friend of Doc's or Shane, whichever way. Sometimes he liked to be just Shane, sometimes he liked to be Doc. Um, I know I'm a special friend because Emma said a message to me this week and told me that Shane said I was a special friend. So that meant really a lot to me. Uh, but we, we were good friends. I didn't grow up with Doc. I, we, we didn't get to Penguin. Libby and I didn't get to Penguin until 85, the week that Penguin won the grand final, which they haven't won one since. But um, we soon got to know Doc. We had the news agency and uh, Doc was in, in the street and we become friends from early on. Uh, I won't go much over the bits I've got about his youth because uh, obviously it's been well spoken, but in my opinion, Doc was the fabric of sort of what Penguin was. He was born and bred, he, he went to school, he worked here, he uh, was in the butcher shop uh, and ran his own shop. Uh, I think everyone who worked and uh, was around Doc for any extended period, fell under his boyish good humour and his charm. He just could not, it was impossible not to be charmed by the man. It was almost like he had these small families everywhere. Like he had, he used to tell me about his family on, 
Hamilton Island, and his family at Orford, and his family at uh, uh, his boys, and, and the clan in Melbourne that he went to work with uh, later in life. And even at the hospital at the end, he told me he'd been in hospital 26 times in the last two years, so he did it tough at the end. But they loved him, they took to him, like he was like family. I mean, they just, and, and we all fell for this knockabout, friendly, gregarious, gentle. He was a gentle person, a gentle man. Uh, so that's why we loved him. Um, but there was a lot more to Shane than even, even the good looks and the charm and, and all those things that we all know he had. He was, he was a very kind man. He was generous, he was generous with his time and he was, true, he was a really good listener as well as a storyteller. He was a really good listener. He'd listen to you and tell you what he, what he thought. But also he was vulnerable. Doc was quite a vulnerable person. Uh, and he had the ability to openly discuss his problems with us. He, he, he wore his heart right there. That's what he was like. He spoke to us about it. And we, that's where the friendships, the true heart friendship came from. At our golf club, which I'm the president of, he was a competent and respected as a captain and as a member. Uh, as a golfer, he was fair. <laughs> but he had the microphone at the golf club and because he was in his element. Each week he'd come up with the, the stories and the jokes and he, de he developed a, a very good friendship with all of our guys and, and girls. But he had an especially strong bond with Kalinda, our vice captain. He sort of trained her and... Uh, and all the boys too, they played well and really enjoyed his time. Doc, he, he, he faced some enormous challenges in, the, in, his, in his life. Apart from the good times he had, he, he had some really tough times. He had really good jobs. Loved, he loved his job at Caterpillar. He loved his job at the school. He lost jobs. He had marriage, you know, his marriages went. He had serious medical complications. Uh, he fought back as best he could. He did the swimming. Whether I never seen him swim, but I swim a lot. <laughs> I swim a lot. I swim no stage, but I never see. He, he was swimming at Preso, so I, I don't, I'm not saying it wasn't true, but <laughs> I never see any evidence. Um, yeah. Anyway, we had a little. A few guys later on in life, later in his life, the last few years got together. A few guys that were doing it a bit tough, and we had meetings at my place and Coop, and quite a few of us. It was about ten of us, and Doc really embraced that and we all got together. I couldn't stop him talking about football, but that's just the way it was. Uh, he wasn't aggressive at all. In fact, he told me he never had a fight, ever. And then he said, I did have one, Terry, at school, and I got beaten up by a girl. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know much about that one, but he also did a bit of poetry. He did a beautiful poem for Swanee. We, we had a big night for Ron Smith and Swanee in town. Uh, Ron had been in business 40 years and Swanee 35 and I think Doc 20 and me 20, whatever, but we had a big night and Doc wrote the magnificent poem about Swanee. I tried to get it today, but it's been lost in the ether, I think. But he, he, could, he could relate that poem verbatim. Uh, in winding up, I just think everyone in this room has, has fallen under the charm of this man. And we all have their stories and acts of kindness and love because that's who Doc was. In the years to come, we won't remember what Doc said and we won't remember what he did, but we will never forget how Doc made us feel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Terry, and no doubt there are some stories that probably couldn't be shared in public. You might relate them a bit later on. <laughs>
As Shane was always up for a chat, it didn't take long for us to strike up a friendship that grew and grew into something very special. It did take me a while to work out that he wasn't unusually free every time I called. He just chatted regardless of the number of customers waiting. Speaking of customers waiting, I spoke to another good friend from those days, Ange, and she shared this story. I remember one day going into the butcher shop after work. Shane looked at me as he took what appeared like a super long step, upon which a decent fart slipped out, and he went scarlet. He looked at the waiting queue of customers and said, whoops, back in a minute, then ran out and jumped in his buggy. The customers are all looking at each other, some giggling, some huffing. Four minutes later, he's back in fresh shorts. <laughs> Without missing a beat, he served the customers their meat. It turns out that following the fart, he had... You can figure it out. Uh, when he told me this, he released his hilarious giggle and we laughed and we laughed. Another one of Shane's favourite sayings. In early 1990, there was an incident and Shane was going to be MBO'd, which stands for next boat off, kind of like a don't come Monday. I was devastated about the prospect of losing my friend and made the decision that as much as I was in paradise, if Shane left, then I was leaving too, as I couldn't imagine life without Shane. Again, I find myself devastated, but unfortunately, life without Shane is a reality that we all have to deal with. Shane had a few jobs. I've mentioned his time as a butcher, and he spoke passionately about his pest control days. He knew how complicated the choice of chemicals could be. Uh, working with wood, losing part of his finger, and his handyman role at the local school. I know there were other roles too, and Gay, another good friend of Shane's, reminded me that he used to work in a shoe shop until he found he had to take the hush puppies out for a piss. How many of you heard that one before? <laughs> Shane had this unique storytelling style and that he had to include at least a name and some detail about the topic being discussed. While I might share a story that went along the lines of, I knew a guy who got a hole in one on his birthday, Shane's version would be along the lines of, a fella back home, Shane Jackson, only has three fingers on his left hand and plays off six, got a hole in one on his birthday. And then, if it was a funny story, as they usually were, that little giggle would follow. The last story he told me illustrates his manner very well. An encounter with a seal, except he did not refer to the seal by name. He was swimming off Penguin Beach, as usual, the fittest he's ever been, when he became aware of a dark shape in the water. Naturally, he was thinking the worst when a seal popped up very close and the two faced off eyeball to eyeball. Shane broke the tension by asking the seal, will you be my friend? <laughs> Naturally, the hee hee hees followed. I'm told that someone on the shore captured the moment uh, and he would love a copy of the photo if anyone could help. <laughs> Shane was as loyal as they come, a lifelong Hawthorne supporter until the day the AFL announced the Fremantle Dockers. The, fril the thrill of being the only guy in Penguin with an AFL team named after him was too big to stay with the Hawks and he became the first Tasmanian member of the Dockers. Shane was not only my friend, but became a good friend to our entire family. And my brother would like to read some words from our mother as well. Good afternoon. First of all, my condolences to the family. The first time I met Shane was also the first moment I fell in love with my husband. Shane was there from the very beginning of our family and was loved by all of us, all four of us. Scott invited me to join, me on a, he joined him on a weekend away in Tasmania, where we were catching up with a good friend, Shane. Scott left earlier in the day and flew into uh, Burnie Airport on my, and left me on my own for the evening. Scott wasn't there, but I saw a taxi driving holding up my sign with a name. I said to the driver, I suppose we're in the pub. He just nodded and led me out to the car park. I was pretty disappointed for all about 10 seconds. Then I saw a limo with Scott, Shane and Debbie grinning in the back, opening a bottle of champagne. That was the start of two beautiful friendships. One relationship being my husband and a dear friend who became godfather to our daughter. I found instant connection with Shane, his infectious love, his love of love, and the way he could see good in anyone and the fun in any situation. He was, he was one of the warmest and most positive people I'd ever known. Shane was there at the start of our family and in the heart of our family. We had hoped that he would be part of our future story too. That is not to be, but he leaves us with memories and warmth of true friendship. And uh, so there's a little more from my dad, who also wants to remind everyone about Shane's poems, which I believe have already been mentioned. Uh, so Shane was at my parents' wedding, and he read out a special poem he'd written for the occasion, a very smelly fart from 10 years earlier that Shane was tricked into detecting while looking for a gas leak featured heavily in the poem, which had the guests rolling with laughter. The poem is now framed and has pride of place in our home. 
There are so many beautiful memories of Shane, it's hard to try and squeeze them into a few minutes. I wish I was there to hear your stories. We know that Shane was taken from us far too young, but let's try and see the positive lessons we learned from him. Shane put his family and friends above all else. He never left anything unsaid and wasn't afraid to talk about his feelings and show his emotions. And the most enduring memory of Shane is that of laughter. As we mourn our loss, let's also make a pledge that in our life without him, we'll laugh and we'll laugh. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the people who have shared their stories and their memories with us today about our iconic friend and I think a uh, respectful round of applause is worthy of our speakers. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you see that seal popping up next and then Shane? He was always one to seal the deal. I have one little story before we have a look at some family photographs. Some years ago I went to WA and I happened to mention to Shane that I'd be down in the Fremantle area and he said, I'm a member of the Frio, the Dockers. He said, here, take my card, my membership card, it might get you in. So it got me in all right and I became Mr Shane Smith. Oh, you're from Tasmania, Mr. Smith. Oh, come in, we'll give you a guided tour. <coughs> Little did I know, they know that I was a spy from an opposition club, which you <laughs> probably know. But anyway, I had a wonderful tour of the Dockers establishment over there, being Mr. Smith for a couple of hours. And upon leaving, I said, look, I'm so grateful if you send me the paperwork uh, with sponsorship and donations and things, send it to this address and uh, I'll thank you accordingly. Well, Julie, of course, arrived the paperwork <laughs> and he never let me live it down. I don't know whether he ever made a donation or not, but <laughs> yeah. So there you go. It was always a laughing point when we met. Right now, we'd like to everybody to just to sit back and go back a little bit in time per virtue of some family photographs and some, some of Doc's favourite music in the background and no doubt many memories will come to light as each particular frame goes through. Thank you.
He might well have won the uh, America's Cup. I bet he'd have given it a red hot go. But thank you to the family for sharing those treasured memories with us. And, and uh, well, as I watched each photo, I could see that none of you have changed a bit. I have a special memory for you, Shane. Your time on earth seemed all too brief because we wanted you in our lives forever. And although we really miss you, in our hearts we know that you are now at peace. Still, countless times throughout the day, we find ourselves remembering you. And although we cannot see or hear you, we know that you are and always will be with us. We will feel you in the warmth of the summer sun. We will see you in the brilliance of the autumn leaves. You will be beside us in the peacefulness of a gentle snowfall and rejoice with us at the emergence of the first flowers of spring. We're thankful for the times we shared and the priceless memories too. For those memories are a comfort now when we lovingly remember you. That comes to you, mate, from your loving family. <clears throat> so hold your loved ones close today and whisper in their ear. Tell them how much you love them and that you'll always hold them dear. Take time to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, or it's okay. And if tomorrow never comes, then you'll have no regrets about today. So some people come into our lives and leave, having made our lives far richer. Doc moved our souls in many ways. He awakened us to new understandings of love, of patience and of kindness. Doc filled the lives of all of those around him with new understandings of generosity and caring, with peace, with love, serenity. When Doc said goodbye, he left footprints on our hearts and we will never ever be the same. Thank you, Doc, for all the gifts that you have left in our hearts, but you will live on in the hearts of all those who loved you. So in grief at his passing, but in gratitude for his life, today we have gathered to say a final farewell to Doc <clears throat> and to thank him for the privilege of being numbered amongst those who grieve. May you all find comfort, richness and example in your many memories. May you find strength and support in your love for one another and may you find peace in your hearts. I think Doc's wish for you people remaining would be may the road rise up to meet you, may the wind be always at your back, May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rains fall softly upon your fields and until we meet again, <clears throat> may God hold you safely in the palm of his hand. And those who think that there is a time limit when grieving have never lost a piece of their heart. We have now come to the final part of our farewell today here in the chapel, but... Before we do so, I would like to offer personally once again to family members and friends my sincere sympathy, <clears throat> heartfelt sympathy as well. I've known Doc Smith for many, many years and I will treasure the memories, the laughs, the good times. Oh, brother. Yeah, so thanks, Doc for what you've left me and thank you to the family for allowing me to help say goodbye to this icon. <clears throat> so we have now reached that part of our service we call the committal where we commit Doc to the next stage of his journey. These then are the last rites in the natural life of Mr Shane Robert John Doc Smith. We have met to pay tribute and to say farewell and so tenderly and reverently we commit Doc for cremation. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Grateful for the life that has been lived and for all that life has meant to each and every one of us. We now leave Doc in peace and with the greatest of respect 
we bid him farewell. Thus thinking of him, <clears throat> let us leave this place in quietness of spirit and live with concern for one another. Resolve that we who live on and those who come after us shall have life and have it more abundantly as per Doc's wishes. You were a good man to many people, Doc. Gone but not forgotten. Gone but never apart. For we are blessed with memories held deeply within our hearts. Thank you for a million of those wonderful memories, old oh, mate. Uh, farewell, Doc. And, and may you forever rest in peace. Yeah. And dare I say it, go the Dockers. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Could I now invite you to stand as we are about to take our final farewell of our dear friend. Thank you. To my love, took it down I climbed a mountain and I turned around And I saw my reflection in snow-covered hills Till the landslide brought me down Oh, mirror in the sky, what is love? Can the child within my heart rise above? Can I sail through the changing ocean tides? Can I handle the seasons of my life? Bring it down